Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who. Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not. I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the big Biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnel Dolion, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, I hope you're doing fine for yourself during a time of major uncertainty. And we're just a couple days away coming in from UFC Fight Night Covington vs. Woodley, a night full of really fun fights. And then the main events that, to be honest with you, I was a fan of. A lot of people were just not a fan of, and there's a huge asterisk to it, though. There's a lot of people who were just bothered by the main event. And whether it be, you know, your political leanings, whether it be your right or your lefty, or your belief in Tyron Woodley, or the fact that, like, both Covington and Woodley, for the most part, are very unlikable and hard to support or cheer for. Like, it's very difficult to support or cheer for Tyron Woodley when the dude naturally comes across as like a heel who doesn't like anybody. Like, I have never seen a Tyron Woodley video package or promo where Tyron Woodley is ever smiling. I know you never see it. Ever. And Covington is a complete troll. And now, and then we saw the main event where we got two bad guys here who no one wants to cheer for. Who do you want to win? Neither person. And so that fight between Covington and Woodley, it ended via Dr. Stoppage because, I don't, know, I don't know if it was Dr. Stoppage or TKO, and that time Woodley somehow popped his own ribs. Like, he was going for a guillotine choke, and then, like, he injured himself. And then Covington, like, I'm, I'm being honest, like, if you haven't seen my review, or if you haven't uh, heard my review yet, I recommend you do. Or if you haven't seen the main event yet, I recommend you do just for the sake of how ridiculous, of how ridiculous it is. From beginning to end, from the entrances, even to the aftermath, with like Kobe Covington, like it's been popping up on YouTube lately on my recommended feed, where uh, the President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, he called Kobe Covington in the middle of his post-fight interview, like he was like he was doing an interview and he's like and he's full on like pro wrestler mode. He's like, yeah, man, I completely conquered Tyron Woodley, man. I destroyed him. I stopped him. I did the one thing nobody else can do, and I stopped him. And then all of a sudden, you see this like arm come in, and it's in front of uh, Kobe Covington's face. And Kobe Covington goes from like pro wrestler, yeah, I'm the best in the world, man. I destroyed him, yeah, into like, oh my goodness, it's the president. Yes, Mr. President. Yes, yes, yes. And all the comments are just making fun of it. And the best analogy I found was Kobe Covington talking to Donald Trump is the equivalent of like a son trying to brag about, trying to like please their angry dad who's disconnected with them by showing off their A. That's how it is. Like, dad, 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 I got an A. And the dad who doesn't even like his son in the first place, like, oh, you got an A. Good on you, son. You did really good on you. I am very proud of you. And the son's like, wow, really, dad? Oh, my gosh. He said I'm proud. Ah. That's how it was with Covington and the Donald Trump thing. It was awkward. It was weird. Covington broke out of character. And then, like, he, here's a Covington look like. He wasn't wearing the sunglasses. So you can see his eyes. He looked like a kid going to the candy store for the first time in years. That was how I described Covington. Like, he, he wasn't like, yeah, I'm the best in the world. Yeah. Like, I destroyed Tyron Woodley, man. I dominated him. <laughs> then he has, like, the, then he talks to the president, and he looks like a completely different character. But then afterwards, after the call he had with the president, he then did another post-fight, like, a post-fight interview thing with Kamar Usman. And obviously, Covington, he he wants to go face Kamar Usman, but we have Kamar Usman versus Gilbert Burns, and that fight is going to be stellar. I say Gilbert Burns is definitely more likely to defeat Kamar Usman than Kobe Covington. 
And so Colby Covington is full on character mode. He's like going through. He's going full on pro wrestler promo. And Kamaru Usman had the best comeback. Pretty much like Kobe Covington is like, hey man, you're an EPO dude, you're a cheater, I'm all American, I'm all American bred and born dude, I'm gonna go and take your title away from you. And then Kamar Usman with a straight face like, I broke your face. Don't talk. I broke your face. I broke your face. And, I, and this Usman is repeating the words, I broke your face over and over and over again. And Kobe Covington, obviously being flustered, is like, hey! You did not break my face. <laughs> like, like, he goes full like yelly mode. Like he goes from like I'm the most cockiest person in the world to like the volume reaches up and his volume started peaking. And then Kamar Usman like said like Are you an idiot, Kobe? And Kobe was like Yeah, I am. But no, you know, you know what? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> you're going down. Because you're going. You're going down. How Donald is gonna go? De- is gonna like, take down Joe Biden? Yeah, it's just. Absolute ridiculousness. It was crazy. And oh man, dude. It just uh so zany. And so the first news to pop up for the first today for the news brief, I'll be talking about Kamza Chimeyev here. So it is coming in by MMAfire.com that Kamza Chimeyev tells one boy Stephen Thompson leave Leon Edwards alone issues his own challenge. Kamza Chimeyev decided to step in on Stephen Thompson's first ever social media call out on Tuesday. Earlier in the day, Wonderboy doubled down on his interest to face Leon Edwards via Twitter, a request he made in a recent interview with MMA Fighting. Wonderboy Stephen Thompson on his Twitter goes on to say, I'll do respect at Leon Edwards MMA, which I have a lot I have a lot of respect for you. I've been saying I would like to fight you for a while now. It makes sense and it'd be a great matchup. I think that was my first Twitter call out ever. Man that felt weird. Then he shows like laughing emojis, then hashtag first time for everything. Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson, man. Good on you. Proper Boy Scout here. Around 10 hours later, the undefeated uh, comes at Chimeyev days after his impressive 17 second one punch knockout against Joe Machart at UFC Vegas 11, called an Ottawa challenging Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson to a fight instead. We fighting next. Let's go. Leave Leon alone. Okay. So, Chimeyev has burst into the UFC fight team with three finishes over a 66-day span. Yeah, so, with his defeats, I mean, with his victory over, uh, with his victory in the past, uh, in the past weekend against Joe Machart, Kamza Chimeyev currently has the record for most wins in the shortest amount of time. No, 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 no. He currently has the most record, okay, he has the record for most wins in the shortest amount of time in the modern UFC because obviously we had tourna- we had like super fight tournaments going on in the earlier UFCs which I'm not really going to count right now but comes to Chimeyev I think it's him and Johnny Walker like Johnny Walker is like 116 days or 106 days of like three wins comes to Chimeyev three day like uh, three wins in 66 days and he's going to have a fight coming up next month so he's going to garner yeah, he's gonna garner within the span of a hundred days. He gets four win. He gets four victories. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And then I was listening to, I was listening to Dana White, where he was talking, where he was giving his reaction to the fights that happened at UFC Fight Night, and he was really blown away by Kamza Chimeyev. He was like, "Kamza Chimeyev, man, this guy is impressive. He is special, like Conor McGregor levels of special." That dude defeated Joe Machart, who is fighting. <laughs> Kamza Chimeyev is fighting one division. Higher than where he normally fights, right? Like in uh, this past Saturday, he fought at 185, but he now actually fights at 170. And next and next month, he's gonna go competing at 170. So comes that you may have, man. The guy is a special athlete. Daniel Cormier, uh, no, Daniel Cormier was talking about how he was all in on comes that you may have. And at the rate that comes that you may have right now is going, I wouldn't be surprised if comes that you may have does end up. Double champion. I think the UFC wants to push Kamza Chimeyev to be a double champion right now. That could be a real possibility. But let me look at the rankings here because this could be a you know people overhyping Kamza Chimeyev. That's a real possibility. But let me look at the divisions here. Who does Kamza have to defeat? Because uh, that DC Daniel Cormier he said that by the end of next year, Kamza Chimeyev is going to be champion. And and Dana White himself says like. He expects Kamza Chimeyev, like no, he he told us to the press. He said 
believe in the hype, join the hype train for Kamda Chimeyev, the kid is special. So what's going on with him right now? Uh, I'm looking at Kamda Chimeyev. He currently is ranked number 15. If I was the bookers, if I was the booker for uh, Kamda Chimeyev, after his next next fight, he should be fighting against Robbie Lawler. I believe to me that is the best fight. Robbie Lawler is a big name, and Robbie Lawler right now is very, very beatable. Like Rob, Robbie Lawler comes to Chimeyev, who's the favorite to win that fight? Comes to Chimeyev easily. Robbie Lawler's striking game is really ugly and not good to watch. Robbie Lawler is pretty much a glorified journeyman. So if I was a booker, I would book Kamza Chimeyev against Robbie Lawler. Chimeyev, no disrespect to Car- no disrespect to Robbie Lawler, dude, but his recent string of fights have not been all that impressive. And because of him just being very lackluster, in his, especially in his performance against Neil Magny and Colby Covington, it's hard for me to place any money right now on Robbie Lawler. So Kamza Chimeyev should be the next best bet then. I think it's not right to put Chimeyev against somebody like Neil Magny. Chimeyev versus RDA would be good. Chimeyev versus Michael Chiesa is good. Chimeyev versus Anthony Pettis. Those are the stars who have enough ma- name value and are high enough in the rankings for him to go and slide his way into a top 10 fight possibly earlier next year. Yeah. I'm looking at this right now. Uh... I believe he could defeat Anthony Pettis here. A lot of the people right now currently in the light, in the uh, welterweight division is very beatable. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at the division right now. It's very strange. So, the only ones who are really worth looking at in the men's welterweight division in terms of like, who are the elite fighters. Usman Burns, Kobe Covington, Leon Edwards. Those are, to me, the elite of the elite. And then from then on, you've got like... Fighters like Corey Masvidal, who is a great fighter, but I don't believe. But I believe the four fighters who are on top of him are just a lot more better, a significant lot more better. I don't see Corey Masvidal defeating a Leon Edwards or a Colby Covington or a Gilbert Burns or a Kamar Usman. I don't think Corey Masvidal. Oh man, would you know be great? So it's rumored right now we might see Corey Masvidal versus Nate Diaz again. And if Kamza Chimeyev, if he keeps the pace that he's going right now. We could see, you know, Masvidal versus Chimeyev. I won't be surprised. I really won't. If we see Chimeyev at some point reach the top 10 early next year. He reaches top 10 earlier next year. And then afterwards, he can go compete with, you know, the, the fighters I named. He can go compete against RDA, against Anthony Pettis, against Tyron Woodley. There are a lot of fights. There are a lot of fights here that many would say are gimme fights. But because they have name value... You know, it actually makes uh, it would be impactful more for Chimeyev's career. So that's the welterweight. How will he do in the middleweight, though? Because Chimeyev is a natural welterweight, but he does intend of competing a middleweight. And I'm looking at middleweight here. Hmm. If he wants to slide his way up, he's currently... So he's ranked number 15 both in the welterweight and the middleweight division. It would makes... It'd be a fun matchup to see Kamsa Chimeyev against Chris Weidman. Chris Mahomet had a really good showcase against Amari Akhmedov. Then that would be an objectively really fun fight. We got two guys who can box, can box. I would put Chimeyev a lot more higher than Wademan, but Wademan's no slash himself in terms of striking. And they're both really good grapplers. They both are. Uriah Hall is set up to go fight against Anderson Silva next month, so I wouldn't put Chimeyev against him. But I like Chimeyev against Kevin Gastelum. That's a winnable fight. Chimeyev against Darren Till. That's actually a very shaky fight, honestly. I think I can see Till winning that fight. Yeah, right now, the... <laughs> really enough, even though Chimeyev is an actual welterweight, there are a lot of bad matchups for him at middleweights. Like, can you imagine coming to Chimeyev against Israel Adesanya? The complete size difference. Him against, like, Paulo Costa. Him against uh, Darren Till. Jack Hermeson. The size difference between Chimeyev versus all these other fighters. Yes, he defeated Mercer, uh, like uh, Gerald, but... He's not high that up, and he's not that high in the rankings enough for me. To be like, oh man, dude, he defeated a true like a true welterweight. Yeah, but that welterweight isn't really high in the rankings. I'm not gonna. From what I saw, I'm impressed with Chimeyev, but 
it's a lot more difficult for him to move up in the middleweight compared to the welterweight. So right now, I don't think I can see Chimeyev depending on how how he does in his welterweight run. Let, let, let's say everything goes perfect for Chimeyev, and he somehow defeats Kamar Usman and Gilbert Burns. I don't reasonably see Chimeyev defeat somebody like an Israel Adesanya. That size, and in or or even a Darren Till, I don't see it. I think there's a lot of size there, and that might be the biggest thing that's preventing Chimeyev from becoming a double champion. And so, coming up right after a short commercial break, here we're going back to the news brief right here, the GSMC MMA podcast. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. Welcome back to the News Brief here. I'm discussing the current ongoing events in the world of mixed martial arts. And this is right now coming in by MMAfighting.com. Charles Oliveira questions UFC's decision to have Michael Chandler as backup fighter for Namar Gamidov versus Gaethje. This is being written in by Gomer Cruz. And he goes on to say that former Bellator lightweight champion Michael Chandler was selected as the backup fighter in case something happens. In the UFC 254 title unification bout between Khabib Nagamadov and Justin Gaethje on October 24, but Charles Oliveira doesn't think it is fair. Du Bronx, who finished seven opponents in a row in a 21 month span, voices his discontent in an interview with MMA Fighting just days after New Broke that, Chan- that Michael Chandler would fly into Abu Dhabi to be available for a title fight in Abu Dhabi. I'm the best, I'm in the best moment of my life. Seven wins, man, and I don't have an opportunity to fight someone in the top five, Oliver said. And now some guy from Bellator who got knocked out in the first round by Patricia Ferry, he gets signed and is the next challenger for the belt? How come? I don't get it. I don't understand. It's seven wins in a row, and I don't leave it in the judges' hands. I go in there and get the knockout or the submission. Go watch all of my fights. The first one all the way until my last fight against Kevin Lee. Which one was? Uh, which one wasn't a show? When did I ever get booed? Never. Regardless if I win or lose, I'm always moving forward, always putting on a show. Michael Chandler, who is 21 five, became a free agent after knocking out Ben Henderson in August and opted to sign in with the UFC after a decade long run in Bellator, racking up an impressive 18 and five victory under the company banner. Iron Michael Chandler lost his belt in just 61 seconds against Pitbull in May 2019, bouncing his bouncing back with first round finishes over Sydney Outlaw and Henderson. Oliveira was hoping to face a top ranked opponent in the octagon after submitting Kevin Lee in the main event of UFC Brasilia back in March, but was matched up against number 11 ranked Benil de Riuge for October 3. So, as uh, Charles Oliveira pulled, uh, pulled out from the fight due to personal problems and says he'll be ready to fight again by November, he declined to elaborate on the issues he's dealing with. It's still unclear if Oliveira will get the fight he's hoping for when he does return, and whether or not Chandler will remain in the next man line for the 155-pound for the 155 pound belt if nothing happens to Nurmagomedov and Justin Gaethje. So, what do I think about this situation? Well, Oliveira makes a point, but what Oliveira is saying right now is no different from all the other journeyman veteran fighters out there who make the same claims. He goes and say, I saw that Dustin Poirier left uh, left the Tony, Tony Ferguson fight because of money, some negotiation, and I definitely fight Tony Ferguson. Oliver said, "I would it would be a great honor for me, a great fight, but it would have to be in November. I can train and focus on a fight and do what I'm doing now. 
I'm training right now. I'm not, but not with the responsibility of knowing I have a fight coming in, no diet or other things while I figure out what I have to figure out. Will Charles Oliveira be willing to fight, uh, um, to fight well, Michael Chandler? You're going to say, is Michael Chandler really tough? Sure, he was the belter champion and deserves respect, but where is he in the rankings, Oliveira said. He just got here with a big name and I definitely fight him, but now I want to fight somebody rank ahead of me. If there's no one available and it has to be him, bring it. I'll show him that he's in the UFC now and there are no fools here. He says, that he's, if Charles uh, could choose, it would be it would be somebody from the top five, any of them. All right, then. So, who does Charles Oliveira think he should fight in the, among the top five here? What Oliveira is doing right now makes complete sense. But you got to remember here, <laughs> I complain about this all the time in almost every single week, every single weekly podcast, in that rankings to an extent don't matter to an extent. I mean, to an extent, like, in the sense that rankings are only used as a reference point. But you don't actually have to follow the rankings here. You really don't. And I believe, here's thing, I'm a firm believer that out of everybody right now in the UFC's lightweight division, I think Charles Oliveira has the greatest... He's the one who's most likely to defeat uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I really believe that. I believe Charles Oliveira is more likely to defeat Khabib than Justin Gaethje is. And then again, Justin Gaethje, he, it'll be Gaethje versus Nurmagomedov next month. I can be completely wrong here. For all I know, Justin Gaethje could go and destroy Khabib. But as of right now, I would say Oliveira is most likely to defeat Khabib just because his submission and his submission style in Jiu-Jitsu is far, far ahead compared to any other fighter in the entire division. If there's anybody who I can rely upon and trust to possibly fight Khabib Nagamadov and handle himself on the ground, it would be Charles Oliveira. And his striking is so dynamic, so bizarre, so out there, so quick, and so because he he pretty much blends in all blends all together. He can go through in like high drop kicks or like flying knees or spinning elbows or spinning backfists. He can pretty much do it all in the octagon. So would I like to see Charles Oliveira against Khabib? Of course. I still remember there was a contest. It was like with Halle Berry and Dana White. And then they said if you donate enough money, you'll be part of a raffle. And then if you win the raffle, you get to go help book what fight you want to see next. And if I won the contest, I would have booked Charles Oliveira versus Khabib. Easy. But now we're having Gaethje versus number game made of. Who would Charles Oliveira fight? Hmm. Ferguson versus Oliveira would be absolutely stellar, man. Ferguson versus Oliveira would be a fight of the year candidate. Without a doubt. But their schedules don't line up properly right now. So all that's left is Paul Felder, Dan Hooker, and Dustin Poirier. He ain't fighting, he ain't fighting Dustin, man. I think Dustin Poirier, he really wants to compete within the top five. And Olvera is just outside of it, being ranked number seven. So I say right now, out of everyone here, it would have to be Dan Hooker. The next logical matchup would be Charles Oliveira versus Dan Hooker. Paul Felder just lost to Dan Hooker, so I don't see a rematch happening anytime soon. So it will be Oliveira versus Dan Hooker. And then whoever Tony Ferguson might be fighting, it might be Hooker, maybe. We could see... Hmm, I'm running out of thing right now. It would not be right for Ferguson versus Felder. It just wouldn't be, wouldn't be right for that. And the other contender here, we got Diego Fiera. He'll be fighting in uh, November 11, no, November 7 against Drew Dober. So yeah, sadly right now, it, it, the most logical sense in this right now would be Poirier versus Ferguson or Ferguson versus Paul Felder. I know we we're like Paul Felder, he's being he's fighting somebody above Dan Hooker, even though Dan Hooker beat him. Whatever. So and then we have Oliveira against either Felder or Hooker. And since both Hooker and Felder they both lost their recent fights, I don't think it's right for them to start negotiating and be like, hey man, I deserve to be fighting this person here. And I'm like, no, you don't no, no you don't. He just lost a recent fight. He just lost it. So, Oliveira versus Felder, Oliveira versus Hooker are the two most probable matchups. I'm pretty sure, 100%, 
both Paul Felder and Dan Hooker would not be happy about that. They would both be like, what the, what the heck? No way. Why aren't I fighting somebody in the top five? And all you gotta do is point at their recent losses. Like, Felder, you just lost to Hooker. Hooker, you just lost to Poirier. Poirier and Ferguson, they're all tied up right now. Sorta. So you have to fight Charles Oliveira or you don't get paid. That's the reality of things. That's the reality of things. And, yeah, so, <laughs> it is, this happens pretty much every single week. And then we have a veteran fighter like Charles Oliveira pop out. Who will always go on and say... What the heck, man? UFC's all about the money fights. Like, Nate Diaz... Like, and the, the fact that Nick Diaz is even being considered to come back to the UFC despite the fact that the dude hasn't won a fight in years. Years. And he's openly, like, talked trash about the UFC and their fighters. And there is a potential chance we could see Nick Diaz come back. It's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. And I always say this. Rankings are not official. The, what you, here's what rankings are. Rankings are just references. They're just references that people go use. Yeah, yeah. It's a reference that people go use, but they don't have to abide or follow it. They don't have to abide. The number, the number two ranked fighter doesn't have to fight the number one ranked fighter. Like, Kaylin Chikagin. Like... Kylian Chikagin, she's been stuck as a number two ranked flyweight in over a year, alright? She's been stuck there for over a year, and she got matched up with, and now she's being matched up against Jessica Andrade, who normally competes in the women's strawweights, who rightfully should compete in the women's strawweights, and if there was an adamant division, Jessica Andrade would fit in perfectly there. Now you have Jessica Andrade, who for the most part competes in the women's strawweight division, now fighting against the number two rank Kaelin Chikagin in the women's flight division at flyweight and is coming in right after Kaelin Chikagin completely mollywop Antina Shevchenko and Antina Shevchenko was ranked like number 15 or number 17 in the flyweight division but somehow she fought against number two person what the heck that makes no sense it just doesn't make any sense and the only way I was able to go and try to convince myself that makes some sense is if I went on to be like, okay, rankings don't actually matter. They're only just used as a reference point in order for someone to go and, you know, just just to see and, like, consider, hmm, maybe she should be that fighter. Maybe she should be that fighter. But you don't have to follow it. You really don't. And so this coming in by MMAmania.com, SB Nation, and Jessica Rose Clark. Shares photo of Beck account was $17.70 after being passed over for UFC Vegas 11 bonus. Just another reminder that fighting for the UFC is pretty lean experience if you aren't lucky enough to get picked for a performance bonus. Do you want to be an effing fighter? By this, this article is being written in by Ryan Harkness. Do you want to be uh, an effing fighter? It's a famous quote from UFC President Dana White that's gotten a lot of um, lionized hype over the years. Of course, the context in which uh, White gave it to it was during the first season of The Ultimate Fighter. You're going to say, like, hey, who wants to be a fighter? And then Jessica Rose Clark on her Twitter goes on to say, a bonus would have been nice, Uncle Dana. I'll do better next time. So, yeah, she... Your balance of 70 was less than the $50 amount of your alerts. You don't make that much money. If you're in the lower end of the spectrum, you just don't. You really don't. Uh, the the tweet shows, uh, who's uh, the tweet shows she's got a whole seventy dollars and seventy cents in her bank account on the morning of her fight. Not that great, and not already by any means. Uh, UFC Vegas ten performance bonus winner Kevin Kroom was in a similar situation. On Wednesday is coming in by Kevin Kroom's Twitter. On Wednesday, I had sixty four dollars in my bank account, and was trying to figure out how to make it sixty five dollars. Hell of a week. Yeah, those winner bonuses, man. Right enough, though, I was watching the interview between Nico Price and Don Cerrone. And Don Cerrone, like, he was, Don Cerrone was ex-Nico Price. And Nico Price is like, yeah, man, it was a great fight. It was a great fight. It was awesome. Yeah. And then Don Cerrone, when he was interviewed, was like, I feel bad because that wasn't a good performance. Also, Nico Price could have made double the amount of money if he was given the bonus that he wasn't able to get because of the eye pokes. So Don Cerrone was like, you know what? It's not fair, dude. Like, Nico Price, he deserves more money. He deserves more. 
He deserves to be paid. He had a great performance. He should have got performance at night bonus. He should have got the win bonus. He should be making a lot more money from this performance. But Nico Price is like, hey man, you just gotta keep going on. Keep pushing forward. You gotta go and do your best. And Don Sterling is being all surly, being like, nah, you're right, Nico. I love you, bro. You're great and stuff. But you deserve better. And I agree with Cerrone. Nico Price does deserve better. It's without a doubt, Nico Price versus Don Struni was the fight of the nights, and it helped carry the card. A card with a main event that was very lackluster. Don Struni and Nico Price should be paid extra for pulling that card, man. That fight should have gone on to be the main event. If it was the main event, five round fight, it could have been a complete classic. It could have been an all time great. It could have been a really stellar, fun fight. But we didn't see that. We know, no, we did see a great fight though. But I wanted to see more. Uh, to be honest with you, when Nico Price was off when that fight ended, I was legitimately thinking of just tuning off because I knew Covington vs. Woodley would not be an enjoyable fight, and I was right. Covington vs. Woodley was not an enjoyable fight to watch. I wish Price and Cerrone had ten more minutes to go. But yeah, man, like these fighters, they should be paid a lot more. They deserve to be paid a lot more, and there should be an instance where the biggest mixed martial arts organization in the world right now is not able to go pay their athletes what athletes should be paid for. Then again, you know, hopefully 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the UFC will be able to make so much money that they can go and pay all their fighters, and all the fighters can walk away with a big smile. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, coming back right after a short break here. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And welcome back to the News Brief. So it is coming in from MMAfighting.com with a video of Robert Deagle submits Sean O'Malley in a grappling tournament final with heel hook. So leglock specialist Robert Deagle submitted UFC fighter Sean O'Malley in a grappling match over this past weekend at a grappling industries tournament final at Phoenix, Arizona. A black belt under John and Ayer, Deagle forced O'Malley to tap out to a heel hook after attacking the same right ankle he injured during his most recent performance against Marlon Vera and for the UFC. Deagle released the footage of the match on his social media, adding he has nothing but respect for the FC fighter. He goes on to say, For Sean, to compete in such an event demonstrates a very respectful desire to grow as a martial artist. Deagle wrote, Realistically, he had nothing practical to gain by doing this event. The man has well over a million followers and is surely making bank in MMA. So why do the events? We spoke afterwards and explained that he simply loved jiu-jitsu. I hope the experience of competing against me helps push him to further development as a mixed martial artist. I was a fan before, but I'm a bigger fan now. And then I see the video out there, and then Sean O'Malley, he goes to say, Sunday service, I love being around the Jiu-Jitsu community, and competing. Honestly, huge respect there for Sean O'Malley for going out of his way to go compete for this tournament. And you know what it really is? Yeah, it's like he really wants to be... So, the big issue for Conor McGregor, because it's impossible not to talk about Sean O'Malley, 
without comparing him to Conor McGregor in the fact that he's supposed to be this young, loud, brash, lengthy, great fun striker guy who's got who's a great character, a true, true character. And I recommend everybody to go look up the, the promo package video for Sean O'Malley versus Marlon Vera because every other video package, and it was the same card that had Stephen Miocic against Daniel Cormier, all the hype packages are pretty much the same. It's always, here's Fighter A, here's Fighter B, here's like Fighter A, here's like Fighter B, and then just a montage of them working out and them making a prediction and like, uh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and knock him out in the first round and yeah, I'm going to go beat him to the ground, I can go beat a man, uh, I'm at the top of my game and I'll do my best to win. Like, it's very generic. But then all of a sudden, when it came to O'Malley versus Marlon Vera, Marlon Vera did... Continue, he continued to do what like what's expected to do for those like high package videos. Sean O'Malley, on the other hand, it's like filmed in 4K. There's a lot of like weird filtering going around. He's in this like really extravagant looking design. He's wearing this like outlandish clothing. The music is not it, the music is not grunge music or new grunge music or like epic trailer music. It's like hip hop. And so out of anybody. In mixed martial arts, Sean O'Malley has the most unique presentation because Nick Diaz and Nate Diaz, like their appeal is that they're like, like they're, they're from Stock, like I'm from Stockton, oh, like I'm from Stockton, all right then, it's like I'm from Stockton, and like we're street tough, we got no nonsense, we can go fight anybody, yeah, FTW, F the world, that's their attitude. But a lot of fighters also have that attitude. Like to be honest with you, there's not that much of a difference between Nick Diaz. And freaking Mike Perry. There's not that much of a difference. There really isn't. And so for Sean O'Malley to be as unique as he is. And he's placing himself in this position where he can be embarrassed potentially. Or get, or worse, even like injured. And here's the thing. In this tournament, he won second place. Sean O'Malley. His his jiu-jitsu game, for all I know, isn't all that special. It's not all that special. And he was able to go get second place in this tournament. And when it comes to Conor McGregor, the one thing that Sean O'Malley has to learn, especially from like seeing guys like Conor McGregor go out, is the fact that you really do need an all-around game. Because if you look at the current champions right now in mixed martial arts, whether it be like Kamar Usman, like, or it be like Kamar Usman, or Miocic, or, or Cormier when he was champion, or even John Jones, like a lot of these champions are people who are really good at grappling. It's like they either are really great uh, really great strikers, but they're competent enough in their grappling that it's not that much of a weakness or there's a grappler like Khabib Nurmagomedov. And with the way how things are going right now for Sean O'Malley, he's a great striker. It just he's very impatient. His decision-making skills are very questionable. But there's no way it wouldn't be like, oh yeah, Sean O'Malley, dude. Like, if things aren't working well for him on stand up, he's going to wrestle me. Like, that's not going to happen. When people see a Sean O'Malley fight, they expect him to go knock someone out or have it be a stand up fight. No one expects it to go be a ground war where he's grappling with you. And for Sean O'Malley to develop his ground game is going to make him, especially at his age, that he's only in his like, early 20s, it'll just make him a better fighter. It'll just make him a better fighter. And. It's good for Sean O'Malley to get through this process in the long term. I feel like if he's able to develop a ground game and a striking game at an early age, the sky's the limit for him, for him man, and his potential will be like off the roof. There's a reason why it comes to Chimeyev right now is currently the talk of the town instead of Sean O'Malley. Yes, Chimeyev, he's the most, like, readers' recency bias there, and that he's the most recent one to go get a victory compared to O'Malley. But if you're to compare who has more potential... O'Malley or Kamza Shemayev. Shemayev has more potential. He's proven that he can go defeat people through wrestling. He's proven he can defeat people through submission grappling. He's proven he can go knock people out with one punch. So yeah, Kamza Shemayev, he's got much more of an all-around game. And the potential for him to become great is a lot more The ceiling is a lot more higher than him. Than somebody like Sean O'Malley, who up to this point is just reliant on the just reliant on the idea that he is a better striker than the opposing fighter 
standing on the opposite side of the cage. And so the following article is being written in by Jed Masha. This is coming in from MMA Fighting, The Morning Report. Justin Gaethje, if I can beat Khabib and then beat Connor, I will have cemented something that is unmatched. Next month, Justin Gaethje will finally challenge for the UFC lightweight title when he takes on the undisputed champion Khabib Nurmagomedov at UFC 254. The fight figures to be one of the biggest fights of the year and as the event gets nearer, Gaethje is starting to become even more focused on the task at hand. And what a task at hand it is. Aside from being the lightweight champion, Nurmagomedov is the second ranked pound for pound fighter in the world and many fighters currently view Nurmagomedov as the most dominant athlete in MMA. But despite all of Khabib's accomplishments, Gaethje has a very simple plan for how to beat him come October 24, make him bleed. I have a really, really good belief that he's going to have a really hard time putting me on the fence, Gaethje told ESPN's Barack Komodo recently. I know I'm going to see his blood, I want him to see his blood, and I want to see his reaction. I don't think he's as crazy as me. The thing, I think he is crazy and loves competition, but he isn't quite as crazy as me. He also hasn't seen his blood as many times, I'm sure. His style fighting is not something where you are looking for blood or anything like that. I bet that doesn't even cross his mind that he will see his own blood that has never been a factor for him. Gichi isn't all the way wrong here in his professional career. Nurmagomedov has been perfect, amassing a 28-0 record. 12 wins of which come, uh, come, inside the, uh, come inside the octagon, the FC octagon. On top of that, Nurmagomedov had never lost a round until the third round of his bout with Conor McGregor. A fight he ended by a fourth round submission, that level of dominance has created an aura of invincibility around the eagle. Justin Gaethje goes on to say, With my family, with my life, with everything, there's different kinds of wealth, Gaethje said. With a win here, I have a really good opportunity. It wouldn't necessarily be generational generational wealth. Yep, it's not going to be generational wealth, man. If it's generational wealth, dude, it'd be like in the millions. How much would he be paid here? I think, like, I think he would be paid around like maybe like two million, two point five million for this fight. Yeah, two point five million in twenty twenty isn't all that enough, but it would be a generation worth of wealth. So that's something. Whether I win or lose, I'm gonna have my mom call her boss and tell her she's retiring. It's effing huge, man. There's a certain amount of money I think one needs to attain in order to have the opportunity to grow exponentially, financially. I think a win over Khabib gives me that. A win at EOC 24 certainly would. Not only would uh, Gaethje take out one of the most popular fighters in the sports and become the unspeed lightweight champion, he would also be setting himself up for a lucrative fight against former champion Conor McGregor. Justin Gaethje goes on to say, Legacy. That's why I'm most excited for this opportunity. I've watched the sport for a long time. I truly think that if I can beat Khabib and then beat Conor, I will have cemented something that is unmatched. Anderson Silva, I wouldn't have matched his title reign. That title reign is something unmatched, but in a different regard. It'll be much bigger. Khabib is the number one pound-for-pound pound fighter, and you have to put it in context of me. Coming off those two losses, everyone's saying, oh, he's done. The fact that the way I was fighting, we all loved it, but there was absolutely no chance I was ever going to fight for a world title. It'll be a legacy that cement that comes to cement. UFC 24 takes place on October 24 on Fight Island in Abu Dhabi. So just engage his plan here. It makes sense. It makes sense. I guess it's you know why? Because I it's happened or I don't So within the octagon and within the fights that Khabib Nurmagomedov has had, never none of them have really been scrapyard fights. None of them have really been like brutal brawls. It's mostly been like one dude dominating the other guy. All right then. Now for Gaethje versus Khabib, the big question mark is Gaethje's wrestling. Because we all know, Justin Gaethje was a Division I amateur wrestler. He's got the wrestling pedigree, he's got the wrestling background, and I think also Gaethje is like top three all time in terms of stuffed takedowns in light division. So Justin Gaethje, he definitely has the pedigree to defeat Khabib Nagamadov. The issue though is that whether or not we are overrating his wrestling. Because when was the last time we saw Justin Gaethje actually grapple with somebody? When? I don't remember. I don't remember. Like, when we think of Justin Gaethje, we think of this tank. This guy who always goes on 
and he always pushes forward. And for Justin Gaethje, well, we never really seen the guy actually wrestle or grapple. He stuffed takedowns. He stopped takedowns. He's avoided clinch work. Okay, good on that. He's avoided submission holds. But for the most part, the guy is a striker first, grappler second. Kind of like Chuck Liddell. We're like, Chuck Liddell, he can grapple. He can wrestle. But for the most part, he's a kickboxer. And so for Justin Gaethje, are we overrating his wrestling defense? Because he's never really been tested. And in the lightweight division, for the most part, the lightweight division is mostly comprised of strikers. It's mostly comprised of strikers. And I think I saw a forum about, I saw a forum post about this. Where someone said that Khabib and Kamar Usman showcased that the UFC roster isn't comprised of the best grapplers in the world. And I agree with that post. I don't believe that the UFC has the best grapplers in the world because why is it that there's one good grappler every like seven or ten fighters? That really should be the case here because when you go look at the lightweight rankings here, we got guys who can grapple. We got Tony Ferguson who can grapple. Gaethje can grapple. Kevin Lee can grapple. Kevin Lee can be a really good wrestler because... Other than Khabib, the only other fighter in the lightweight division who is, like, who actually was a, no, who is a grappler first, striker second, would be him and Charles Oliveira. Not Dan Hooker, not the Poirier. Nate Diaz can grapple. He's a really awesome grappler, but we know him mostly for his boxing. So how many fighters currently right now in the lightweight division would, can you say, oh man, this guy's first initial game plan is to go in and grapple with a dude. His win conditioning is grappling. We got Khabib. We got Charles Oliveira. Not really all that much. So how good of a grappler is Justin Gaethje? Is his grappling ability good enough to go and stop Khabib Nurmagomedov? The truth is, we don't know. We really don't know. I am... Obviously, the safe pick is Khabib. And the safe pick for Gage Giver is Tony Ferguson. Was Tony Ferguson, ironically. I really believe Tony Ferguson would have defeated Justin Gaethje during the lead-up to that fight. I kept saying Ferguson was going to win because of X and Y. He had more time to go prep up and for tra- He had more time to go get his body ready, to go get, tra- to go get training. We all know Khabib's, uh, we all know Tony Ferguson's grappling, uh, grappling and striking is freaking A-tier. And I thought Ferguson would outmatch Gaethje in every facet. And watching Gaethje's fights, where he has a tendency of being a tank, I don't really see Gaethje all that much fighting all that smart. But you know what? Justin Gaethje, he proved me wrong. He proved me wrong in that fight. He defeated Tony Ferguson. What an upset. And if Justin Gaethje can pull off two consecutive upsets, man, it would be a great, amazing story. And pretty much Justin Gaethje, in terms of his financials, would be secured. If he can have a perfect run for the next two years, he's going to have He's going to be financially secured for, for the longest time. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Coming back right after a short break here. See you soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. And this upcoming Saturday is my birthday. Yay! It is my birthday, but also UFC 53. I'm going to go out um, with me and my friends. We are going to wear masks. We are going to distance ourselves from the other groups. Because um, right now, I currently live in Orange County. So in Orange County, things are almost back to normal again. I went to the mall. Like, out of curiosity, I went to the mall. And it turns out that like, it looks like a normal mall. There are just people walking around it. Like, all the stores are all open. Yeah, there are, like, limits. There's, like, a five-person, ten-limit, uh, ten, uh, ten-person limit per, like, per stall or per store in the mall. But for the most part, the mall looks pretty much the same. Lol, the mall looks pretty much the same. I just went to Denny's last night. 
And in the dead news, there weren't as many people, but there were there was indoor seating going on. And so things are pretty much normalizing right now. And it is expected that, this coming from Adam Silver, uh, who is the commissioner for the NBA, that he expects fan attendance to come back as early as early 2021, around January. He's going to aim for fan attendance happening. And currently right now, in the NFL, there was a, I think it was a, it was a Cleveland game. It was a Cleveland game. And they were able to go put in 21,000 people in the stadium arena for the football game. So yeah, I know I know some uh, some arenas are not allowing fans. Some arenas are allowing some fans. But the fact that the Cleveland yeah it's Cleveland Browns, the fact that the Cleveland Browns were able to let in 21,000 people, dang, impressive. So I would be surprised if you know UFC or belts or end up bring you know fans back in as early as 2021. So, I'm putting this out there. I am safe, and um, and I'm not doing anything wrong with me taking my friends out to Buffalo Wild Wings, us eating the spicy chicken. I also ordered the hot ones, spicy like the hot ones. If you ever saw the YouTube the YouTube channel YouTube show where they have the hot ones challenge, where they have all these spicy food and they're putting it on their chicken. Yeah, I got it there, man. I got it. Gonna bring it to Buffalo Wild Wings. We're gonna eat our spicy wings. As me and all my friends are all yelling at the tip of our tongue, like, "Yeah, man, woo, yeah, Adesanya, let's beat Paulo Costa, yeah," because uh, my friends are supportive of, of Israel Adesanya. So my birthday coming up, Buffalo Wild Wings normalization of sports and you know people going into public events now. Also, right now, ironically, this Saturday there's also like this like Christian worship service right now. This outdoor Christian worship um, area. Or is expected we're going to have over 100 people there. Yeah. Things are getting a wee bit normal. But UFC 253, I'm going to give a short preview of what to expect from that show. According to Dana White, he says this could be a fight of the year contender. And every time he said that, he ain't wrong. I got the betting odds here. First off, we have Israel Adesanya versus Paula Costa. Adesanya coming in at minus 175. Paula Costa 150. So Adesanya is the favorite coming in. Even then, 175, 150, that's very close. We got Dominic Reyes coming in as a heavy favorite against John Blackwitz with minus 280 versus plus 230. Kai Kara France, minus 230 versus Brandon Royvels, plus 190. They'll be competing at the flyweight division. We got Caitlin Vieira, who's coming at minus 170 versus CR Eubanks at plus 145. Shocking there. I would put my money on CR Eubanks there. I would say CR Eubanks is a favorite against Kaelin Vieira, but the betting odds say something else. We got Hakim Duwudu against Zubiro Tukumov with uh, minus 105, minus 115 here. So, very, very small side edge, very, very close fight. Jake Matthews, minus 650 versus Diego Sanchez, plus 475. Diego Sanchez, you love the guy, but he ain't winning this fight. Dang, plus 475, yikes. Uh, Brad Riddle, minus 310 versus Alex da Silva, uh, plus 250. I think you're doubting Alex da Silva. Shane Young, uh, minus 135 versus Lord Ben plus 115. Alexa Kamur versus William Knight, which is minus 175, plus 150. Juan Espino, minus 300 versus Jeff Hughes, plus 240. And Kabisa uh, 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 oh, let me say, Kadis Ibrahimov, minus 170, vs Danilo Marquise. Who's also right now currently at plus 150. So it's coming in at September 26th. Location being at Fight Island. This will be the first Fight Island uh, Fight Island fight coming up since the recent Fight Island. So there's a whole lot of hype coming into this fight. And here are my predictions for the main two fights. We got Israel Desanya versus Paulo Costa for the middle of the title. Dominic Reyes versus Jean Blackwoods for the vacant light heavy title. And I agree with the betting odds here. For Israel Adesanya and Dominic Reyes to go win in their respective bouts here. So for Adesanya versus Paula Costa, Dana White is assuring us, at least through, through the interviews, that Paula Costa will be the one who will be pressuring Israel Adesanya. He will make Israel Adesanya work. It's not going to be a boring fight. And if you follow Paula Costa's YouTube channel or if you follow him on Instagram, the narrative right now is that Paula Costa will be the one who will pressure Adesanya. Because Israel Adesanya is a counterfighter for the most part. When he fought against Rob Whitaker, when he fought against Yoel Romero, Israel Adesanya's fighting style is counterfighting. He's an exciting counterfighter. 
but kind of like Anderson Silva, he has to be walking backwards, or he ha- or the fights like Anderson Silva fights are very exciting when the opponent they're facing is just super aggro and aggressive. And so for Paulo Costa, if you don't remember Paulo Costa's fight against Yoel Romero, to which is Costa, he just keeps pressuring in on Yoel. And how do I think this fight's going to lay off? Well, I think Costa's going to try in. It'll, get, it'll be very similar to Robert Whitaker, in that Paulo Costa will be the one trying to pressure in on Adesanya. And Israel Adesanya is going to utilize his length and his really good count- and his really good boxing and footwork He's going to lay some really good counter hits onto Paulo Costa. But Costa, being a proper tank that he is, is going to go and get knocked down like Robert Whitaker was. I don't really see it. Even though Costa hasn't been tested. Okay, no. He hasn't been as tested as Israel Desanya in terms of name value in the record. Like, yeah, Paulo Costa defeated Johnny Hendricks. He defeated Yoel Romero. Okay. But about in terms of accumulation, Israel Desanya has more... More not been tested, more so than Paulo Costa. So, and because of that, I say Paulo Costa is going to pressure in on, on Izzy. Izzy is going to be able to duck under. He's going to be able to evade all the shots. He's going to land in some clean, uh, some clean counter shots. And the size and the length of Adesanya versus Paulo Costa, and the fact that is Adesanya, despite his frame, he isn't a twig man. He isn't like the dude's freaking. The dude's a rock solid hard man, dude. He's tough. The guy will take these hard shots. And he's going to eat it. And because of his durability, because of his boxing, because I, I believe Izzo Adesanya is a better striker than Pablo Costa. I really believe that because of the length, because of reaches, because of the fact that Izzo Adesanya has more experience fighting in these long, like these long rounds, in these championship rounds, in these fights, Pablo Costa's cardio has not been tested. Pablo Costa has never been in receiving, except for Yoro Romero. Uh, he's never really been in the receiving end of these long, drawn-out, scrapyard fights. And that lack of experience, for me, is the reason why I am going to pick Izzo Adesanya defeating Paulo Costa. Now, from the videos I've seen, Paulo Costa is going to go push forward for leg kicks. And I think that is really smart. If Paulo Costa can go shoot in for some really strong leg kicks and somehow be safe enough to go... You know, he'd able to like back away from Izzo Adesanya's counter striking and from his long jabs. I think Paulo Costa can possibly itch in his way for a victory by decision victory. I say right now this fight's gonna end by decision. I don't think this fight's gonna end by knockout. I don't think it's gonna end via submission. I don't think either fighter is even gonna shoot him for takedowns. I think this fight is gonna end by decision. It's either gonna be You know what I say right now. Split decision or majority decision is Adesanya. It can go either way. It can go by decision victory for Paulo Costa. But I can see this fight being incredibly close. And I can see both fighters closing out rounds. And it could be a complete toss-up who wins. And then we have Dominic Reyes against John Blackowitz. And obviously, Dominic Reyes is the favorite to win this fight. You know why? Because Dominic Reyes... In my personal opinion, I believe should have defeated John Jones. I don't think John Blackowitz is good enough to beat somebody as good as John Jones. The fact that Dominic Reyes was able to go toe to toe and possibly, and you know, yeah, the fact that he should have defeated who many consider to be the greatest of all time in John Jones makes him the favorites. And the way how and John Blackowitz, I think he's too slow. That's what I believe right now. I think Jean Blackowitz, he's way too slow a fighter that I believe Dominic Reyes is good enough to go and he's going to push the pace on Jean Blackowitz. His boxing, I think, is a lot more better, a lot more cleaner, a lot more crisp. Jean Blackowitz has a tendency of going a little bit crazy there, but I believe that Dominic Reyes' striking and his boxing and his footwork is a lot more better than Jean Blackowitz, and he's tested it, and he succe- and he's almost successfully got victory over Jones. And because of that, I'm placing my money on Dominic Reyes. But once again, these are all just predictions. For all I know, Paulo Costa could defeat Izzo Desanya. For all I know, Jean Blackwitz could defeat Dominic Reyes. But this Saturday, man, dude, it's going to be wild. It's going to be a fun night of action, and I recommend everybody to go see it. And, you know, actually, there's a video that popped out. So there's a video that popped out where... Both Adesanya and Paulo Costa 
they just like randomly meet each other. It's always interesting to see. I think there's a video where Hori Mazwa and Kamar Usman almost met each other, like in the hotel. So Adesanya and Paulo Costa, they are right now, as I am talking, currently are in Fight Island. They're currently in Fight Island, and they both met up with each other, and they're both like passive aggressively, like talking smack at each other. Very interesting. There it is. Also, I'm kind of excited for Israel Adesanya's whatever his new entrance is, or whatever his new like, whatever he's gonna go for for his like over the top entrance here. I saw, I remember Dana White he did an interview he says I don't like Israel Adesanya dancing. <laughs> well, I can't imagine Dana White being really that much of a dancer himself. So, huh? Who am I to judge? Boy, we, we got some predictions coming in right now. So Frank Camacho says I love the way Costa fights and I think he can land a knockout punch. Don't really think... I don't think so. Andre Ewell uh, says Adesanya is going to win. Randy Costa is going to go say Israel Adesanya is going to win. Uh, Tyson Nam says that if Costa doesn't knock him out in the first, I think Izzy Adesanya is too technical and will defend his belt. I don't see Costa knocking out Izzy Adesanya. I really don't. Now watch. I'm, if he is able to knock out Israel Adesanya, man, dang. Dang. Talk about a shocker. Whoever is betting money on that fight, dude, and says that uh, Costa's going to get a knockout victory. Wow. Just wow. And okay, every time I'm looking at news, there's always, like, I'm not joking, like, every couple days, there's always a post being shown out there where it's like, look at Paulo Costa, man. That guy is in great shape. Look at him. He's jacked. And there's, like, a new image circling around Paulo Costa that says, like, Paulo Costa looks amazing in the best weight cut ever. I am shocked that Paulo Costa can look the way he is and somehow still make it to middleweights. Even though, dude, even though the dude looks like he'd be a natural at heavyweight or heavyweight. The guy, he has some weird genetics, man. <laughs> really weird. And ironically enough, though, Israel Desanya, thinking ahead of the fight game, he's getting like he's getting a call right now from Kanzu Chimeyev. And really enough, comes a Chimeyev versus Israel Adesanya, I would pick Adesanya winning just because he's just way too big for Chimeyev in terms of size and stature, in terms of reach and length. I would pick Adesanya winning that fight, dude. But let, let's not be surprised if at some point in the near future we could see Adesanya against comes a Chimeyev. It could be too soon for Chimeyev right now, but just like Daniel Cormier, just like Dana White, I am all in on comes a Chimeyev being a title contender at some point in the middle of next year. I firmly believe that, and if it does happen, wow, just wow. And so UFC 253 is right around the corner. This Saturday, I recommend everyone to go watch it. October 26th, the... Wait, when does it start? It's going to start usually at 5 p.m., 7 p.m.? All right, then. So, like, okay, UFC Fight Nights typically start at 5 p.m., but they're in Abu Dhabi, so fight times there are kind of different. But it's going to happen Saturday, September 26th, at the Flash Forum Arena, 7 p.m. Pacific Time, Go watch it and expect to see what many believe, especially Dana White, to be a potential fight of the year candidates. And that brings to a close for today's podcast. You have been a great, great audience. And all I got to say is thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.